I've chosen for my title, Prepare for the End, in two important ways. As we all know, these are very unusual times, and I think all that our Bible students are seriously thinking about the end of the time when Jesus will come. And so I have chosen to present this message on these two ways that we need to prepare for the end. We begin by uh, looking at Matthew 24, verses 12 and 13, where Jesus, in this chapter that was telling us how the end would be, he said, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. How true those words are today. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So our task in the last days is to be true to God until the end. It's not going to be easy. It will keep getting harder. And one of the things that's going to make it harder is that there's going to be a rise in false religion, a religion that does not come from Jesus. And so it's going to look good to many people, and yet in that are things that God told them not to do. Also, we find a interesting thought in Galatians 5, verse 7, speaking to a particular person in the church, Paul said, ye did run well. In other words, they became a genuine Christian. They followed God for a while, but they didn't stay. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you? that ye should not obey the truth. So even though the person chose to become a Christian and to follow Jesus, the time came where they went off the path. And this is a warning for all of us. None of us are above the possibility of losing our way. But the closer we are to Jesus, during this time and the future time, the less chance there will be for us to have run well in the past, but then uh, go off the path and stop obeying Jesus like we used to do. Paul, in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, addresses his own habit of life, and it's a good one for each one of us. He said, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't work that way? In the worldly system, when they run a race, only one can win. It might be a second prize or third prize, but only one can get the first prize. But in the Christian life, that's not true. And our danger is that we don't put the same amount of energy into running the race that these people do, even though they may not win. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. So in uh, running the race to make it to heaven, to be able to endure through the times that are ahead, it is very important that we strive for the mastery by being temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Understand, in those days, one of the things they got was a, a garland of flowers. Well, that's not going to last very long. Now they usually give gold trophies and so on. It gets set on the shelf, 
And uh, they work like everything to get that prize. But Paul says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. Every person that runs the race and endures to the end will win eternal life. That's the good news. And Paul is announcing it here. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, <coughs> lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So he said it's an ongoing process. I have to battle every day, but I'm not fighting a battle of beating the air. Instead, I'm fighting the battle against the desires that are not according to the Bible. And uh, I seek to bring these into subjection, not by my own power, but through the power of Christ, because I am determined that I will not lose my way, that I will not run well for a time, but then lose my way. And every person that understands this danger and will do what Paul did will finish their course successfully and eternal life will be theirs. Paul, we know how his life turned out and he was successful to the end, faithful to the end, and can look forward to that wonderful place in heaven that God has prepared for him. Now, in order to assist us in this, Jesus gave a final promise in Matthew 28, verse 20. He said, Lo, I am with you always. You don't battle alone. I am with you always. And we're going to look at this idea a little bit because sometimes we don't realize how eager Jesus is to connect closely with us. I don't think there could be any young man that is pursuing a woman, a young woman, that would be more uh, eager, he couldn't be more eager to join up with this young lady than Jesus is to connect with us. And so he said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He's pledging his faithfulness to us until the end comes and he can take us home with him and of course then we'll be with him all the time. Now the first area that we want to look at that is a preparation for what's ahead, preparation for the end, is our spiritual growth. Now I'm sure every person that's listening to this has an interest to grow spiritually. But in times of ease, it seems like most people do not grow as much as they could. But now as we look at the future, it should be the real stimulus package to stimulate us to really get serious about spiritual growth. Jesus has wanted it from Old Testament times. Let's read Deuteronomy 4, verses 29 to 31. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. He says, if you really want a close relationship with me, I'll be there. You'll be able to get it. You can have as close a one as you want. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. That's what those runners and other uh, people did in the Olympics even very long ago. They put everything they had into it so they could win. And God says, if you'll do the same to uh, get eternal life and to 
develop a relationship with me that's a close one, you will get it. I promise you, you will get it. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient unto his voice, then it has a parenthetical thought, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swore unto them. Now, hopefully those that are listening to this will not need that provision. But you are already seeking a closer walk with God. You recognize already that this time in which we're living with the events that are happening, we must seek a closer relationship with him. But our text gives assurance to those who forgot about that. They drifted away. They lost their relationship with Jesus. They went for a period of time without seeking that close walk with him. And he said, if you wake up, then I will listen. Don't worry, I haven't been losing my interest to connect with you. It was you that lose, lost your interest in connecting with me. And so if you will recognize your need and you will turn to me with all your heart and with all your soul, you're going to find me. And even if it's in the latter days, or in other words, just before the end, that's what I will do for you. What an amazing promise given so long ago, and still is true today. In Deuteronomy 5, verses 24 and 5, And ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. Now this is... Uh, a reference to Mount Sinai experience when God came down and as you study carefully you find it was Jesus that was there giving those Ten Commandments and so the people saw his glory and his greatness his majesty and his power was so amazingly developed there and shown there and so they're they're commenting on that and it says, we have seen this day that God doth talk with men, and he liveth. In other words, you came and you talked to us and we're still alive. It was pretty scary, but we're still alive. Why? Because God wants to talk to human beings. He wants to connect with them. However, they were so scared, they said this, Now, therefore, why should we die? It's like saying, well, we didn't die this time, but uh, if you keep talking with us, we, we may die. So, um, now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore. Then we shall die. So God was approaching them to try to help them want a close relationship with him. But instead, they wanted to back away because they were fearful that if he kept talking with them, they would die. Now the story goes on, verses 26 and 7. For who is there of all flesh that hath heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and live. Is there anybody that has not died? Well, yes, as there was. But I guess what happened on Sinai was uh, different than what happened before. And so maybe it's, it's uh, true that previous to that time, uh, nobody uh, had that experience. And, and stayed alive. Of course, nobody died either. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. Now here they're speaking to Moses. 
They're saying, Moses, you, you talk with God. We don't want him to talk with us anymore. You go and talk with him, and then you tell us, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. Now here, they make an agreement with God that whatever they are told to do, they are willing to practice. And no doubt, this promise was made because they saw that divinity was so powerful and even scary to them. And so they requested that any more communication come through Moses. And of course, the rest of it did but God would have loved to have drawn close to them again if they would welcome it. And then going a little farther, verses 28 and 9. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when ye spake unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they has spoken. In other words, the, I accept their promise that whatever I ask them to do through you, that they will practice it. And that made God's heart happy, although he knew what the future was. And so at that moment, we have the heart cry of God. This is his desire. He says, oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. And so God is really saying in this verse, I'm glad they were willing to make that promise, but I know the condition of their heart. They don't have a close relationship with me. Oh, how I wish that they had a heart relationship with me. And that because of that, because of my presence in their life, that they would be able to keep their word and keep the commandments and that they would reap the results of it, the blessings which are not only blessings that take place on earth, but to inherit eternal life and to be a part of the wonderful future that he has for them, he says, oh, I wish that that could really be the case. Well, the after history of the Jewish nation shows us that God knew, but we see his longing here, and that longing has not changed. He still has that same longing today, and each one of us need to uh, face that issue. Is God longing for something we don't have? Is he longing that there was a heart in us that led us to just love obedience and love to do what he said and to be faithful to all the instructions that he gave because of that close relationship that we have with him? Now, Moses did have it. And there were a few back then that had it. And Moses was able to talk with God face to face. And even though he records that uh, it was a scary event for him too, but he didn't want to stop. He wanted to have all the communication he could get. Now there's another one that's sort of a follow-up to this in Deuteronomy 18, verses 17 and 18. And here, Moses is talking to them about what they said, which we just read from Deuteronomy. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. So God is saying, okay, they're too scared when I come close to them with my divine power and my divine majesty and glory. And so I, I will not come to them again. I will listen to what they have said. However, he promises to do something else. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren. 
Now, if you notice, the word prophet here is capitalized. Why? Because it's not talking about the prophets who wrote the Bible or any of the other prophets that have had a, a smaller part in the Bible history. And it's not talking about those in the last days that will be prophets. But it's talking about Jesus. And what we see in this text is that since Jesus couldn't get close to them from his divinity, he told them in other ways before this, but this is one of them. He said, I'm so anxious to have a close relationship with you that I'm going to come as a human being and I'm going to be a prophet. That is one of the offices that Jesus held while he was on earth. He had many of them. And so uh, God is saying through Moses, I will raise up them, I will raise them up, a prophet, which is Jesus, from among their brethren. In other words, a human, the human nature. And the reason he wanted to come as a human being like unto thee, or in other words, human like Moses was, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. In other words, Jesus said, I can't just stay in my divinity. I have to come to earth as a human being so that I won't scare people anymore, and so that I can communicate with them and try to help them to see how much I long for a close relationship with them. And of course, it was fulfilled. Uh, people weren't scared of Jesus, generally speaking. But instead, they didn't want to listen to him. They didn't even feel he was had a divine nature and condemned him for saying that he had a divine nature. But of course, now... We know he was both human and divine. So the issue for us is we have seen his longing to be close to us. And the question is, will we let him? Will we be as eager as he is? Well, I'm sure we can't be as eager as he is, but uh, more eager than what we've been in the past. And here's a few sentences that are calling us to that purpose. Child Guidance, page 471. We never needed close connection with God more than we need it today. You know, those words were penned a long time ago, but they are the type of words that become more necessary the closer we get to the end. And so if we think about where we're at right now, very close to the end, Truly, there never has been a time when we need a close connection more than at the moment. However, the sad news from 4th Testimonies 402 is there are but few who are living near to God. Now at this point, I hope that each one of you that listens to this message will ask the Lord, don't, don't evaluate yourself because you may be fooled. But ask Jesus to help you evaluate where are you? Are you really living near to God? Or are you halfway there? Or, or maybe even just a little bit? There are few. And this, of course, is talking to church members. It's not talking to people of the world. We don't expect them to have a close relationship with God. But when we are part of the church, it says there are but few who are living near to God. And if Jesus points out to us that we're too far away, there's very little time for us to get busy, but we need to get busy immediately and seek to live near to God. 
Also, the same book, page 400 and 401, says a close connection with God will bring to you in your labor that vital power. Now, this is primarily talking to ministers here in the context, but really, the pastor is to be an example to others. And so, God is calling all of us to a close connection with God because from now until the end, we need to work like we've never worked before. There is so much to do to warn other people and help them be able to be ready. And we need that vital power, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But only those that have a close connection with Him can receive that vital power. And one more, uh, Councils on Health, page 367. A close connection with heaven will give the right tone to your fidelity and will be the ground of your success. So, even our own experience will be strengthened by our close connection with God. And then we will have success that we couldn't have before because God is able to bless us and we won't take the credit because we know that the success is coming from Him. So, right now, we need that close connection with heaven so that our spiritual experience, which leads to faithfulness to him, is strong and thus we can succeed in the work that God has given us. Now, some of you are aware of this quotation, but it's one that we should remind ourselves often because it tells us the best way to get close to Jesus. Fourth Testimony is 374. It would be well to spend a thoughtful hour each day reviewing the life of Christ from the manger to Calvary. Now maybe you've done that in the past, but if you haven't done it recently, I think it would be a good thing to do. And there's a wonderful book called Desire of Ages that expands the story of the Gospels and helps us to really view the life of Jesus from beginning to end. As we look at those beautiful pictures of what Jesus did and what he was like, it changes us and uh, we need that thoughtful hour every day. Now that may not mean 60 minutes, but a period of time, whatever we set aside. And, and the closer you want to get to Him, the more time you should set aside for reviewing the life of Jesus from the manger to Calvary. We should take it point by point and let the imagination vividly grasp each scene especially the closing ones of his early life. So we need to uh, not just read it, you know, in uh, a short period and, and reach the end of it, but we should stop along the way and we should try to imagine the scene and try to imagine what Jesus was like in more complete uh, terms. And as we understand the various scenes that Jesus experienced while he was on earth. It helps us to draw close to him by thus contemplating his teachings and sufferings and the infinite sacrifice made by him for the redemption of the race. We may strengthen our faith, quicken our love, and become more deeply imbued with the spirit which sustained our Savior. Those are the things we need very desperately from this time on until the end comes. Notice the blessings by thinking about what he went through, 
thinking about what he taught, thinking about how he uh, loved people, how he uh, cared for each one, all those aspects. And notice what happens. Our faith will be strengthened. And we have to have stronger faith as we go into the future. Our love for Jesus will increase. And you know, as our love increases, then we become more aware of the love that he has for us. Another thing, and we become more deeply imbued with the spirit which sustained our Savior. Now this one is not talking about the Holy Spirit, although uh, no doubt the Holy Spirit was the one that caused this to happen. But the attitude that Jesus had in submission to his Father's will, no matter whether it was bad or good, no matter whether it seemed like success or failure, he was always submitted to his Father's uh, direction. The spirit that he had is the spirit that we need because Jesus knows what's best for us. And when we really have the relationship with him that we should, we are willing to be submitted to his will and do what he says because we know he loves us and we love him with our whole heart. That, I believe, is the most important thing for us at this hour. As we look into the future, we must examine our spiritual experience, not our knowledge of the truth, although we should improve our knowledge of the truth all we can, but we must examine our heart relationship with Jesus, because that is the foundation, and we must seek to get closer to him than we've ever been before, as fast as we can. The second point I want to look at is the call that God has given for years to leave the cities. Now, many of you that listen to this have already moved out of the city, and that's good. But I want to share a few things that you might think about after looking at a few of these points. In Genesis 4, verse 17, we read this, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. Now this is not the Enoch that the Bible uh, talks about that's such a godly man. But this was a sinful son of Cain. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So one of the things that Cain did fairly soon after his <coughs> failure and his killing of his brother <coughs> was to build a city. Now, if we think where cities came from, came from the first sinner that lived on the earth, the one that turned against God and uh, never did turn back. We have no record that he ever turned back to God. He was the one that wanted to have a city. Now, it wasn't big, probably like the ones we have today, but nonetheless, it was a city where people lived close together and influenced each other in a pathway of sin. And then, I didn't have time in this study, but we could trace this down through the Bible. And we discover that God's people like to live in the mountains. You know, just take Abraham. He was living in the mountains. And, and Lot, he wanted to move down uh, at least near the city of Sodom for the benefits that that would bring. Well, we, we could look at uh, dozens of these things. The godly people seem to want to live in more rural areas and sometimes even secluded areas because there are reasons for that and we're going to look at some of them. In uh, Country Living, page 28, 
says the instruction is still being given, move out of the cities. Establish your sanitariums, your schools and offices away from the centers of population. In other words, all the institutional labors that we are to have are to be out in the country. Why? Because the workers that have to work there will benefit from being in the country. Many now will plead to remain in the cities, but the time will come ere long when all who wish to avoid the sights and sounds of evil will move into the country. For wickedness and corruption will increase to such a degree that the very atmosphere of the cities will seem to be polluted. Wow, have those words ever proven true? And now it's gotten to where the enemy is trying to move into the country and bring the corruption of the cities even to those in the country. So it says here that the ones who wish to avoid the sights and sounds of evil will want to move in the country. Now I'm not sure exactly what those possibilities are going to be. It could be that people won't be able to do it so, so well anymore. Or it's possible that God will give a brief uh, reprieve and things will get better for a while. If they do, don't get fooled and settle back into regular life because it's not going to stay that way very long. But on the other hand, if it's too late to really sell what we have in the city and move out to the country, then we can praise God that some people have done it and hopefully they will be willing at the proper time for us to come to where they are. But this has been a call for well over 100 years, probably closer to 150 years, that God has been speaking to his people about this. In Country Living, page 14, says, I urge our people to make it their life work to seek for spirituality. Now, this is a quotation primarily on moving out of the cities. But as I thought about it, it's pointing to the first point that I made as a reason that we can get closer to God in the country than we can in the city. Christ is at the door. Well, if he was at the door then, he's really at the door now. This is why I say to our people, do not consider it a privation when you are called to leave the cities and move out into the country places. Now, why would that be said? Living in the country is harder in many ways than living in the city. But it is easier to have a close walk with God. And that has to be our top priority to seek that close walk with God. So if we go to the country and things are harder and we have more privation, let's not grumble about that. Here, there await rich blessings for those who will grasp them. He is eager to give it to us. He tells us how we can get it. And then, of course, he will fulfill his promise. And one more on this topic from Christian Service, page 161. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. So the time is coming when, if we're going to be faithful to God, we don't have a choice. Right now we have a choice to stay in the city or to leave. But 
The time is coming when that choice will be gone. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in a decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. So if you read there in uh, Matthew 24, you discover that Jesus said, when the army surrounds Jerusalem, if you're on the housetop or you're in your house or wherever you are, you're in the field, don't go home. Leave. Leave everything you've got. Get out. This is what I call the last call from the city. If, if the people don't leave then, they're going to be in prison or be killed or have uh, very serious things happen other than a direct miracle of God spiriting them away like he did Philip. But uh, that's the very last call. Can't take anything. You just have to go somewhere where maybe somebody else has been making some preparation. It will then be time to leave the large cities, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. So in other words, there's still time to work for God. Probation hasn't closed. We must, if any of us are in the city, we must leave the city. And uh, we can expect a harder time, but it is worth it to leave them. And we still work in the smaller places, the country places, the smaller towns, and so on. We work them, but then the time comes we have to leave that to uh, secluded places uh, among the mountains. And God is leading some people to develop those places for us so that those that uh, end up making the mistake, or I, I could say God might call somebody to stay in the city for uh, his work somehow, but uh, that person then, when they see that happen, they need to leave. Uh, and probably at that point, they have to join somebody else. Now, those of you that are already in the country, you may think this part doesn't apply to you. But I've noticed something about people that have moved to the country. Generally speaking, they still live like the people in the city rather than adjusting their lifestyle to the country lifestyle. I had the privilege of growing up as a boy on a 125 acre farm, which I believe was a providence of God because my dad was a minister. And so as long as he was a minister, he was in the cities and towns and so on, sometimes in a big city. And uh, so that's where I would have grown up. But something happened and he lost his job. He didn't lose his credentials, but he lost his job. And when he lost his job, we moved to Massachusetts on my grandparents' farm, which was 125 acres. And my dad had to make a living by various means and of course in the country we got involved in gardening on a on a good size scale my grandfather had a large blueberry patch in fact at one time he sold blueberries for part of his living and so we could pick all the blueberries we wanted and we in those days we didn't really have freezers so we canned the blueberries enough to last all year we uh, also had blackberries that grew in the fields. And so I remember picking blackberries for 10 cents a, a, a quart. And uh, then we put those up as well. We grew a garden. We, we had a, a basement that had a dirt floor. And so it uh, kept things cool. It was like a root cellar. And when we harvested our potatoes, we harvested enough to last all year, and we put it in the root cellar. 
and the green beans and the other things that came in, the tomatoes and so on, we put them up. The property had some apple trees. And so we would pick the apples and we would can the applesauce. And, uh, you know, at, at the end of the summer, we had put up enough food to last us all winter. But what I notice is that when people move to the country today, they don't do that. Now, I don't know what's ahead. You know, I don't, I don't know how difficult it's going to get to buy food. But if you've been living the lifestyle of the city, you're going to be hurting. You're going to be looking for somebody that can help you. You know, I've been getting messages through my LinkedIn program that I have from various pastors in other countries, and it's way worse over there than it is here. And they're pleading, please send us some money. If you don't send some money, our people are going to starve to death. Well, I don't know whether I can trust them or not, so I, I'm not going to send money. But uh, I, my heart hurts for, for the situation that people are in because they have not been living the lifestyle that used to be very common in the country. Other things, too, go along with country living, uh, but that's the one that I think is going to become a concern. Now, we do know that the time is coming when we cannot buy and sell. But before that time comes, when God called us to live in the country, he expected us to watch how country people live and to learn to garden, to put up our food for the year so that we would not starve to death if we had to go all the way to the next harvest when we would plant again and we would stock up. Now, of course, a few things you probably can't uh, get from your plot of ground, uh, but uh, we might have to do without as much salt and without some of the things uh, someday, I don't know. But uh, at least we wouldn't go hungry. We would have plenty of food to eat. And so God is calling us as a people not just to get out of the city, but to learn and practice the way of country living. Now, there are some of you that may be beyond the years when you can fully do that. Don't worry. God will take care of you if you can't do it. But all of us that are able to do it need to do it. And God will bless us as we look to the future we won't have the trials that some other people are having. We will still be able to carry the message that God wants us to carry to the world, and we can still function. So may God bless us as we look toward what's ahead, not knowing fully what's ahead, but we have some of the details. And these two things are crystal clear, both in the Bible and in the other quotations that we've read, that God is calling us like he never called us before to seek a spiritual experience with him that is deeper than anything we've ever had. He's waiting there. He knows our need. He has been trying to get it from us. And, and he will be happy and he will give us all that we want. And the second thing, is to, if we're not in the country, to make serious plans to get to the country, or at least to a small town, and to learn how to live the way people used to in the country. I notice many don't do it in, now, but to learn what we have to learn so that we can live in the country, and God will help us to learn fast. God bless you. May you have a wonderful Sabbath.